Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we talk taxonomy. What is a species? And Professor Chris Jackson asks, what defines a dinosaur? Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards. I don't know why I'm sounding a bit like your auntie, but you should sit down because we're going to what what I consider to be a very spooky, scary session because we're basically just talking about bodies and how they are put together. You're doing taxidermy again, aren't you? Oh no! (laughs) (laughs) I get confused between them. Also, taxidermy and taxi journeys, very similar. Yeah, you don't want to mix them up. (laughs) So taxidermy is when you stuff things, which is basically how zoology started. 18th and 19th century people going around killing things and then stuffing them and showing their friends. There's there's a lovely... If you go to the Natural History Museum in London, and there's the big flight of stairs in the main hallway and it branches off. And I think it's on the left-hand side. And there's a statue of some bloke with a big safari hat and a moustache and a gun. And it says something like, Hunter and scientist, doctor such and such and such. <laughs> because in the 1850s, these were kind of synonymous. Look at all these magnificent new species we've discovered in the colony. And how exactly did we discover them? Well, <laughs> but you can't bring them back. It's not like there were fast planes or trains, and you couldn't keep them alive because, like, animals need things like food. In in France, I think it was Louis the Thirteenth or the Sun King or whichever one it was, had the famous cases full of all of the exotic animals from around the French Empire, and this is partly how people got interested in classifying animals. So, so Wallace, we've talked about Wallace previously in this series. Yeah. Yes, and the birds of paradise the, with the no feet and no wings, which is the why they were supposed to be paradise animals. They flew without any kind of limbs and presumably therefore ate air and were the most wondrous of creations, which, which they are, um, but a bit less magnificent once you lopped half of them off <laughs> and stuffed them in yeah. a box for six months as you shipped them back. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not talking about taxidermy. No, we we were we're talking about taxonomy, which is the Is that like accounting? In a way. So it's it's the science and or frankly art, and we'll kind of get into that, of correctly identifying and naming species and higher groups. So obviously we're mostly interested in genus and species, which goes hand in hand with a bunch of other things like identifying evolution relationships. And so the taxonomy and systematics and phylogenetics and a bunch of other words that we don't really to talk about it's all kind of merged together now but you know at the real coalface almost it, it, it is still here is a thing we have dug up in the case of paleontology obviously or you know i've gone out into africa or indonesia or russia and found this new thing is this a new species and if not what is it and how do we know that and that that's really what this is ultimately getting at yes i did this once with i went into kensington park and I was looking at all the different birds. And there was a seagull. It was like the only one in there. And it was a seagull I'd never seen before. Mm. It had bright, light blue legs. And I was like, what on earth? The seagull with bright, light blue legs? I, got, I took a photo of it on my phone. I got really excited. And I raced home. And I got out my old bird book. And I was leafing through the pages and looking at the gulls. <laughs> Common gull. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was called. A common gull with bright I never I, it looked like a blue footed booby. I was really excited. No, no, common gull. Yeah, that <sighs> that, that but- happens quite a bit. Are species primarily identified by what they look like? Anyone who's done probably GCSE kind of certainly high school level biology has probably come across the definition of a species as being a group of individuals or a population that can breed with one another and produce fertile offspring. That That is a very commonly used one. And that is a thing called the biological species concept. And right off the bat, I've got to say there's about something like 30 species concepts out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's loads. This is one of many. Um, I set my students an essay title last year, which was, is the biological species concept the worst species concept? <gasps> which I think it is. I, I think in, it has, it is so fundamentally flawed and inapplicable that it's actually the worst one. And yet it's the one we teach in almost every. <laughs> 
see every school as being a definition of a species. It's fine if you're looking at sort of mammals and husbandry, surely. If you're looking at orchids, it's nonsense. Well, right. So this, so the first problem is it's completely inapplicable to anything that's dead, any part of the fossil record. It's completely inex- um, inapplicable to anything that is asexual or can be asexual, which is huge numbers of vertebrates. You know, there's lots of lizards and fish and other things, um, as well as, you know, bacteria, plants, you know, vast swathes of organisms. But even among the things that you'd think it would apply to, how do you actually do it in practice? If I go out into the Himalayas and find two, and find a new pheasant and I go, I think this is a new species and it's different to these other two pheasants. By the biological species concept definition, the only way I can do that is to actually try and get them to breed, which is potentially a huge amount of time and effort. <laughs> Ever. Oh, it sounds fun. Right. It, it sounds and, and, fun. <laughs> trying to romance a pheasant. Well, well, precisely. But it, it's ludicrously unhelpful and not actually practical at all. Your blue-footed gull. There you go. Did you know that that's a, a common gull because you saw a picture of it in a book or because you got hold of other common gulls and you made them breed with each other to prove that your one that you saw in the park was the same species? Uh, my logical fallacy was one of authority. That's what I went with. <laughs> This is fundamentally the issue with the biological species concept. So going back to your kind of original question, actually how most people, and I don't just mean the general public, I include scientists in that, will identify things is, yeah, of their basic appearance. Because for huge numbers of things, yes, lots of them there aren't, but we'll get into that, but for huge numbers of things, if you look out the window and it's a small black bird with a yellow beak in the UK, that's a black bird because nothing else looks like it. Yes. Great tits and blue tits and cold tits tits and chaffinches and goldfinches these these all have very clear different features to them and we can tell those apart pretty much instantly and you don't need to do any more complicated digging than that and you never get a great tit shacking up with a cold tit so lots of things hybridize readily and even produce fertile offspring which is another problem with the Ooh. biological species concept um the this idea that this is a really good measure of separating things out just isn't at all for large numbers of things particularly plants But we could, for example, define them by how they breed. We could define them by their appearance, either simple external appearance, like it's red and blue with black spots, or internal appearance, like it's actually got a relatively long leg compared to its arm, and it's got 23 ribs, but not 22 pairs of ribs, and it's got 16 teeth, but these others have 12 teeth. And their behaviour to a certain degree, in particular these days, we'd look at their genetics, either the mitochondrial DNA, which is the little kind of energy cell thing. It's a female DNA. DNA that comes down not through the female. Usually, but not exclusively. There are very rare occasions where you get male inherited um, mitochondria. But you can look at the mitochondrial DNA, you can look at the organism's DNA itself, um, and other things as well. And a really important point, which needs to be stressed at, the, at this juncture, is most of the time, most of those things line up with each other really, really well. So if you look at blue tits and great tits, yeah, they have clear external differences in terms of like their basic color patterns but they also don't interbreed and their internal anatomy is quite different and their genetics are clearly distinct and if you examine things like their behavior you'd see that is distinct and if you put together a family tree of them you'd see that they're fairly close relatives but there are other species in between so evolutionarily they're distinct so all of these things line up which is really useful i just want to interrupt for our american audience who don't have blue tits and great tits native to their lands and might be thinking of some other things. <laughs> but these are these are small little birds, and you should look them up because they're very cute. And there are no bluebirds in the UK, no. and so whenever they play the song, there'll be bluebirds over the White Cliffs of Dover. I always think of blue tits, and it's not there actually where they should be. So <laughs> it's not their environment. So but that yeah, song is you just know, wrong. Pit, you know, American robins, which I think are a kind of thrush. So you know, th- those and red-winged blackbirds, say, or some something like that as a comparable. But but the point is, the point is, for those who can't imagine these things, you're looking at tiny little sort of tennis ball-sized animals. <laughs> yeah, not uh, even that. Which are very, not, not much more not than even a ping-pong that, no, ping-pong ball. ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the the key point of that is these do actually overlap and therefore a lot of the time it doesn't really matter that much what species concept you're actually using it is still pretty useful and this is then relevant because then when we step back into the fossil record what we're fundamentally using particularly for dinosaurs but you know DNA does turn up in some relatively recent fossils and subfossils Mammoths. but right but 
fundamentally, as soon as you're into kind of like true lithified fossils, um, you're using what is called the morphological species concept. In other words, it's its shape or what it looks like or literally its anatomy. And that's what we're doing with dinosaurs. So when someone asks the question, you know, how do you know if a dinosaur is new or, you know, what's the basis of naming a new species? This is it. It's the morphological species concept. And so what we're basically doing is looking at the anatomy of whatever fossils we have and comparing them to their nearest relatives and and seeing how different they are. And if they're sufficiently different, they're probably a different species or genus usually with dinosaurs because we're, we're talking about the, the, the next rank up uh, in taxonomic terms. And then if it's definitely different to everything else, we'll give it a new name. That is what we're doing. Okay. Why is that a problem though? Why, so why can't we just go, that ah, looks like a cow. It is a cow. Right, because it's hard enough doing it on living species. Um, you know, humans in some ways are actually a bad model for this because we're so variable but men and women look different from each other and kids look different from adults and kids look different from teenagers that look different from adults and old ladies little old ladies right people in the netherlands are particularly tall um people in like the philippines are not yeah you know and and that's just the grossest differences and you know there's huge variation you know there are people out there who have fewer or extra toes or fewer or extra ribs or weird you know there's a very square jaw you often get in men there's a more flat face you often tend to get in some Asians you tend to get a kind of slightly extended lower jaw in various African groups and those don't immediately mean that all these different peoples are you know particularly adults and juveniles and males and females you're suddenly talking about different species variation is normal and so this is why it kind of becomes an art rather than a science in that sense in that it's getting a really good handle on what normal degrees of variation are and what you know the kind of overall gestalt or you know total holistic species is um and only then is it relatively safe to start talking about what is and isn't part of that species it's particularly too true with selective breedings and dogs and things because you could have like a chihuahua and a great dane which can't actually they don't even fit the species um definition that you did because they can't actually reproduce a male chihuahua cannot reach and a um female chihuahua would die in the process of giving birth to the puppies because they would be bigger than her. Dogs are particularly weird because they are so artificial, but yeah. we do have those kinds of kinds of issues going on. So let's say we go out and find a panda next year. It's just like the giant panda, except rather than black and white, it's black and red. It's identical as far as we can tell. It's just that white patch is now red. Is that a different species? It could just be an odd little colour. We know colour varies massively in species all the time. On the other hand, it could well be that those that the normal black and white pandas don't like the look of the red panda. They think it looks a Aww. bit... I've used red as a bad choice because there is actually a red panda. Um, but, you know, the, the red giant panda, you know, it looks weird and they don't like it and they don't really want to breed with it. In which case, arguably, it sort of is because it is now biologically separate in terms of breeding capacity. And things like this do occur in nature. It's really not as simple as, is it different? Because even identical twins for humans, you will find some differences or some subtlety in their anatomy if you look hard enough. So, you know... And, and equally, some very different looking things do breed and interbreed really quite happily. There's loads and loads of different trees, which depending on just kind of what soil type they've got underneath them, they'll grow as tiny little bushes or great shrubs or a normal big trunked tree. They can look very different to each other, all generated from the same patch of seeds. So it, it really isn't a simple case of just different or but same. plants are crazy. I mean, plants even... are a nightmare. Yeah. That, like, if you get a fruit tree in this country, they usually, you know, depending what size of fruit tree, depends which um, root stock they're grafted onto. So you've got a root stock, which is one different species to the tree that's actually fruiting something else. Yeah. And it just is about what size you want it for your orchard. It blows my mind how these things are so adaptable and plastic. Yeah. I My, my suspicion is that plants are much better at that because they have very little choice, if that makes sense. If, if you're a tiny little animal, of whatever description just having hatched or leaving the nest or whatever and it's a bit too dry where you are or a bit too wet or a bit too hot or cold or too much sunlight you just move 
if you're a tree and you've started putting your roots down, you're going nowhere. So you have <laughs> to be able to grow wherever you are. And I think that gives them a huge... Then how can I kill so many houseplants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ditto. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I have acres of them in here and I, and I keep hardy stuff and I still kill it semi-regularly despite putting quite a lot of effort in. I feel so I bad. Know. I try. But, that, you know, that, that is really the, the difficulty. And then you've got the tiny, tiny, tiny problem dealing with the fossil record and dealing with dinosaurs that the vast majority of their information is gone. We don't have their colours and patterns and skin and or feathers or scales and we don't have their muscles and we can't measure their physiology and we can't look at the size and shape of their heart or... We can't tell what ones they were attracted to or their offspring. And even the skeleton that we've got is almost certainly half missing and possibly broken and stretched and has distorted by sitting in rock for 100 million years. And that's what we're working from. And therefore, it's kind of inevitable that we have some pretty major disagreements over what things are or are not a different species, or even things that are um, exactly how we define them. I was literally chatting on Twitter with a colleague this afternoon about um, this odd little Chinese pterosaur. And I said, I, for the record, I think this thing is almost, a, it's been named as a new species, a new genus and species. It's almost certainly genuine genuinely is its own genus and species it's from from china it's from quite a long time ago and they all are i know sorry <laughs> well because I've, 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 I've got slightly ahead of myself but if you look at the definition that the authors gave it when they named it they basically said it's unique and therefore it's different because of the following list of re things all of those things are also in rampharynchus so ah. that definition doesn't allow you to tell it apart from rampharynchus now the bit that I misspoke slightly earlier is it almost certainly is different because it's about 15 million years older and from China. That's pretty unlikely. It's not impossible. How many species last that long anyway? I mean, could it be the same species 15 million years? I suppose crocodiles. Well, so that's the difference between kind of species and bigger lineages. You know, sharks have been around hundreds of millions of years. This species of shark generally hasn't. The records of some are in the kind of 10 to 20 million range. So it's possible it is a rampharynchus. I say, I think on average it's unlikely. Most species knock around for a few million years. So it is unlikely that it's lasted 15, 20 million years and spread to the other side of the continent and hasn't adapted and changed in some fairly major way. But as written in the actual scientific literature, you can't prove that it isn't. And what's adding to the problem in the case of this little thing in particular, it's called King Long Opterus, if anyone's interested, um, is it's really quite a young juvenile. And of course, anyone who's, you know, you see baby deer and baby ducks and things like this. There once was an ugly duckling and it grew into a swan. Right, but they not only do they change, but they look a lot more similar to each other when they're young than when they're old. If you look at, you know, three-day-old chicks of almost any pheasant or almost any chicken, you would really not be able to tell them apart. And yet, of course, when they're fully grown, it'll be really obvious. If anybody's ever looked at embryos and the way they grow, I mean, literally, this it's almost impossible to distinguish between a dolphin and a human. Oh, yeah, until a month or two in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so th that's another aspect of the problem in particular with the fossil record because we're dealing with juveniles often so this is really what it all comes down to as when someone goes here's a new fossil do you think it's a new species you're looking for those features first of all you've got to know what it is and that's where a fair amount of skill comes in this is what i always tell my students when i teach them about taxonomy it's similarities and differences what similarities does it have with other things that you know about which give you a good idea of what it is and then does it have differences which mark it out as different within that group so a good thing is retractable claws so cats famously have their retractable claws um, there's a couple of badgers and a couple of stoats that can do something similar but not to that same degree and there's some unique anatomy associated with that and the point being therefore is that you go and dig up an, a new fossil mammal and you find those toes with fully retractable claws instantly you're really very sure that it's a cat of some description because the only thing we've ever discovered that has that is cats so you've got 
right, there's a big similarity there. And then you, you check things, you know, you check the shoulder blade and the tail and the skull, but you know, you've got those similarities. Yeah. Right. It's definitely a cat. Now I know it's a cat. What features does it have that are different to every other cat? And if you then go through and go, okay, it's got longer teeth for its skull size than any other. And it's black back legs are a bit short compared to every other and this, that and the other. This is probably something distinct. So it's like a saber-toothed tiger to me. It does. Of some distri- <laughs> right, but the, and, and this is it. And then, you know, populations vary, like we said about humans. And it's it's true of everything. We've mentioned island giantism. You know, you get giants on islands. You get dwarfs on islands. That doesn't mean they're necessarily a distinct species. There are certain, you know, genetic alterations or genetic defects that produce really common reproducible developmental issues. So there was a thing just a couple of months ago about a dwarf giraffe that had been discovered and it's a a, it's an achondroplastic dwarf it is fundamentally the same genetic it's got dwarfism like humans right and you get in dogs and loads and loads of other species and so it has these characteristic proportions if you found that as a fossil animal on the one hand it would be fairly easy to mistake that as a new species of short-legged giraffe on the other hand i think someone sharp would spot that actually it's a chondroplastic because it has this fairly distinctive pattern another common one is you get the hemingway cats so cats that are polydactyl with five six seven digits again that's really quite a common phenomenon to have extra digits we're on the lookout for that often those extra digits have fairly common properties to them because they're often not quite the same as the others that's the kind of thing particularly if it's more than five because almost nothing has more than five digits as a tetrapod at least so some whales do and i think a couple of the marine reptiles do and that's basically it but you don't usually see six seven eight digits in anything that lives on land and berlin was a whale this is what's <laughs> and, and, and now there's a good example of that kind of false dichotomy that goes into that kind of other problem of how we define groups and things like that do you know what this most reminds me of? Imagine going to China and trying to pick out the difference between a language and a dialect. Yeah. It's another way that you just go, well, hang on, do, can I actually speak? Because I know lots of people who learn Mandarin, but that doesn't mean that they can speak Chinese to people who don't speak pure Mandarin yeah. in that sort of, you know, national sense. And it's exactly the same because it's a geographic location thing. And it's the variance within regions, but then who can communicate and who can't? It's very difficult to tell from the outside unless you're already in it and you can understand. Yeah, and and that's the thing. And evolution is a continuum. You know, things mm. are constantly changing. There is no human alive today who's older than, what, about 110, 115. So in 1900, not a single person alive now was alive then. So at some level, they're completely separate from us. And yet, obviously, there's a complete continuation. And it's exactly the same... You you know, in the fossil record, you know, there is a continuous evolutionary history for the last three and a half, four billion years, whatever it is, but that we don't have every single representative. So the, the example I like to give is imagine like a, a color chart, like you get on a computer and you're selecting a color and it brings up a little thing, you know, and it's like black in the bottom left corner and right in the top white corner and every shade into red and to pink and then white again across that thing. And if you drew a line from the bottom left to top right, that represents every single individual or every single bit of the population over, say, 5 million years. Now, the bottom left is definitely black and the top right is definitely white and in the middle it's obviously red and below that it's dark red and above that it's pink. But where does red stop and pink start? Mm. (laughs) That's the problem. And in some ways, the fossil record is easier because what we have, actually, because we don't have all that smear, is we do usually just have literal dots. And so, actually, it's fairly easy to say, well, actually, this is darker red and this is quite a rich red. They're probably different. In some ways, that's easier than looking at living species, which are still changing and having weird populations and this and crossbreeding and hybridizing and doing weird things that you wish they hadn't and local variations. The advantage of lack of data. It's a bizarre one, but yes, uh, in some ways it is. Um, and you you do get into this problem occasionally, particularly with fine levels of things. So, you know, with some of the human work, you know, you ha- have two things that look really quite distinctive and then you find find something that sits right between the two which actually looks a lot like both of them mm-hmm. is this one thing which is really quite variable or is this three things that aren't very distinctive from each other and neither of those is a particularly satisfactory definition or explanation <laughs> I don't want to talk about crossbreeding and human
humans because that's yeah well uh, yeah and uh, but right and yeah. we have you know there's really good evidence of hybridization between homo sapiens and neanderthals and the denisovans whatever the denisovans quite are um and and all of this going on it's not as simple as here's your population everyone looks exactly the same and they all look definitely different from everything else therefore species oh if only <laughs> Yeah. So what about their names then? Say you've got dug up a fossil, like you've done this before, and or you, and you've described it, and you know it's a new species, and then you call it Dave's Dinosaur Friend. Yeah. And what do you call it? How do you decide what it's called? The, there's a whole bunch of conventions about naming things. We've talked a bit about this in the past, I think. So you're not allowed to name it after yourself. That's the first one, which everyone always asks. At least a couple of people historically have got around this by doing things like, I'm naming it after my great-grandfather, who by sheer coincidence was David Hone. So <laughs> hey, name this new <laughs> species David Honus. Um, nice. pe- people have done stuff like that. Uh, you're supposed to use the Roman alphabet. You're not supposed to use uh, accents, so no umlauts and acute and sedillas. There are a couple of very rare hyphens, but they're not normally allowed. And it's supposed to be not in English. So originally, of course, this was all in ancient Greek and, and Latin in the last 20 years in particular. But certainly since kind of the 60s, there's been lots of use of local native languages. Um, of, like Nguebisaurus. Like Nguebisaurus. Saurus, yes, which I'm not going to say properly. And Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, named after Quetzalcoatl and, and things like this. To be defined as a species, it also has to be defined in a, in a genus. So we are Homo sapiens. That's one everyone's heard of. Aloe vera. Aloe vera. Boa constrictor. Uh, these are genus and species names. And these are the very few ones that people have heard of. And of course, Tyrannosaurus rex. So the genus has to be unique. The species doesn't. There's a species anectens, uh, which I think means the other one, basically. And there's a whole bunch of things that are da-da-da, anectens, da-da-da, anectens, da-da-da, anectens. That doesn't matter. There's a whole bunch of things called rex that be on Tyrannosaurus. Mm-hmm. So you can replicate species names as much as you like. The, the number of things named after Darwin that are Darwin I or Darwin N. Yeah. Um, you know, loads of them. But the genus has to be unique. So there is only one Tyrannosaurus. There is only one Corvus. There is only one Carcharodon, Triceratops, Homo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With, and here's another little caveat, because historically the naming of organisms has been split into two distinct groups, one of which is animals and one of which is plants, fungi, and bacteria, i.e. kind of everything else. And you are allowed to duplicate names between those two systems under the expectation that it would almost never happen and it should be pretty obvious which one it is. So there's a genus uh, Aotus, A-O-T-U-S, which is both a monkey and a shrub. <laughs> I will confess now and say it in advance, I've been very tempted for quite a long time when I next get an opportunity to name something, to name name a dinosaur after a really, really common plant name, um, like Quercus the oak. All the little gardeners going onto their garden centre website trying to look up a chrysanthemum and all they get is a photo of, t- of a t- Tyrannosaur. <laughs> <laughs> or a hadrosaur knocking around from Wikipedia. That would be great fun. Um, that would be taxonomic vandalism, and I probably won't do it. But you, every so often, you do get these duplicated names. But you have to have a genus, and you have to have a species. And that that's really the limit of it. You've got to create a name which ideally means something. In fact, there is a rule somewhere in the text. This is the ICZN, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. And there is a rule somewhere buried in it, I believe, along the lines of, if a name is distinctive and memorable, that is to an advantage. So there's famously all kinds of joke names. So there's a beetle called Abra that has the species <gasps> name Cadabra. So it is abracadabra. Nice. Uh, uh, there's an nice. there's an agravation. Uh, <laughs> is there an agrophobic as well? I, I don't I don't know, but but there are things like that, um, and usually they do mean something. Stegosaurus means roof lizard because it's got the plates. Diplodocus double beams because it's got its two little things. It, it's linked in some way to what that animal is or does or looked like, um, and that is a very common thing. And if you once you know quite a few names and their meanings, it does actually help you remember what these things are. 
which is part of the reason I personally don't like place name Asaurus. You know, there's lots of Edmontosaurus. Okay, it's a dinosaur from Edmonton. That really doesn't tell you, you know, Cynosaurus. Okay, it's Got nose. a dinosaur from China. It's, <laughs> I was going to say, nerf- I thought it had a big sinus cavity because I'm an idiot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and in terms of the, like, the formal process, so this is the getting into like the nitty gritty of it, if you like. So what do you actually have to do to get a name verified? So you have to declare that your name is new. You have to give it its name. If it's a new genus and species or just a new species in an existing genus, you, you have to have what's called a holotype. I think we've talked about holotypes before. Yes. So that's like the defining specimen, hmm. um, which obviously with living things is usually easy because you've kind of got your choice with fossils. It's whatever the first one is you found, unless you're lucky enough to find 10 of them. In which well, case it'd be you- terrible if the defining specimen, so like say in order just to identify a cow, so they, they basically kill a cow, the perfect cow, and then, then every, every cow is measured against it but they had to do it with a human too there's a movie there um so there's an interesting little quirk of history about that exact issue actually but we'll get to that and then the, the the key bit which is what causes the vast majority of the problems is the definition and diagnosis so you have to say how you tell it apart from everything else and that's where that little pterosaur example that i gave has a bad definition and diagnosis um, it doesn't actually list any features which are truly unique but also remember that things change constantly we've talked about spinosaurus and, and baryonyx you know so baryonyx when it was first described had loads of new new unique features because at the time it wasn't recognized as being the same thing as spinosaurus and in any case the original spinosaurus had been destroyed by a bomb in world war ii so you all you had was a 80 year old description in german <laughs> that wasn't very long and had two pictures in it um but baryonyx had loads and loads of unique features and so the people who wrote the original description and defined it said, you can tell it's baryonyx if you see this or this or this or this or this or this or this, because they're all in baryonyx and we've never seen them in anything else. Fast forward 20, 30 years when we've done lots of research and dug up a load of others and loads of those features now turn up in other species. At the time they were unique, but we now know all of these help define the spinosaurs as a whole and half of them actually will not tell you that you've got baryonyx merely that you've got a spinosaur. So I wrote a paper two or three years ago um, with Tom Holtz, who I've also done the recent Spinosaurus paper with, and one of the things we're doing was revising the diagnoses of the various Spinosaurs for these exact problems, that a whole bunch of new species had been discovered, and a lot of the earlier descriptions and the diagnoses didn't work anymore. If you looked at the original baryonyx definition or the revised one from about 1992 and you said, I've got something that has half of those features in common with it, therefore this is baryonyx, um, you may have, it's just a spinosaur and it doesn't tell you anything about it, its genus and species. When I was about two or three years old, I used to be in the back of my mum's car and apparently looking out and I occasionally, just very occasionally, I just go, Jaff, Jaff, which is how I used to say giraffe. And it was only when they worked out that I was talking about phone poles and right and you see that's the same thing i know one thing about giraffes which they have a long neck i'm <laughs> seeing cables and assuming well that therefore must be a giraffe is exactly the same as if i found a bit of dinosaur bone that looks like baryonyx doesn't mean to say that it is baryonyx yeah that is my useful um summary of what you were saying in izzy language it is that issue yeah and so this is another problem with taxonomy is that we're constantly revising things like the definitions and diagnoses because things have actually changed. So you combine that, particularly with dinosaurs, with the fact that loads of this research was done 100, even 150 years ago, and we've lost some fossils, or the descriptions weren't very good, or people were writing at a time in the absence of knowledge of what other people were doing, because scientific communication was far more complicated, and bits didn't get measured properly, and people didn't understand things like intraspecific variation, or differences between juveniles and adults, and all this other stuff. And you can see why even Even now, we're going back and revising and reworking stuff that's 100 years old and discovering that stuff we thought weren't species, like Brontosaurus, we've now brought back 
Yeah. And stuff that has knocked around forever and a day actually should never have been named in the first place and needs fixing. Stuff that sat in museum drawers with one label on it suddenly makes sense as another group. We talked about that with the pterosaur episode. There were all these little Darwinopterus-like things, which were written off as like, oh, it's a pterodactyloid, but it's gone wrong a bit. Ah, suddenly we've got a good specimen. We've got like this Rosetta stone, and then we can go back and, and correct all these issues. So taxonomy is this constant renovation and updating and up upgrade of everything simultaneously with all this data. And in our first episode, we talked about the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And of course, Nanotyrannus is a very debated animal. It's exactly it doesn't that exist. One. Is it a juvenile? We need yep. more information. And and Tyrannosaurus had the early names of uh, Dynamosaurus. And oh, what's the other one it had? It's now I love Dynamosaurus. It makes me think it's got a sweatband on and it gets on its bicycle and it works out in the 80s. You can totally imagine that as being the logo, the name and logo go of a company <laughs> dinosaurus <laughs> yeah well you got puma knocking around that's yeah, true the, the little sweatband with the teeth and yeah. then little action pose <laughs> with shoes on oh, this yeah. is why uh, neither of us are marketeers um <laughs> yeah. but that's what you actually need to do to name a species and the, the last thing you need to do as well which is on the list is make sure that that definition and diagnosis and that whole little description and package is widely available and in the old days that meant making sure it went into into internationally recognised library so that that data was available and informative. Nowadays, it usually means just putting it online. And it's worth recognising at this point that, sadly, this actually makes things very open to abuse. There is no requirement for something like peer review. In other words, for other scientists to actually check that before it is published and validated. And there are cases of people who just randomly see stuff in museums or randomly collect stuff and then go, oh, Oh, it's a new species and they write something which is very non-scientific and inaccurate and poor science and stick it on the web or self-publish it. If you're giving me hope that I can go and do this. You see. <laughs> send them to journals and then these names are now in the scientific literature and that causes problems. So what you want is an overarching institutionalised dinosaur uh, official stamping body. Maybe, maybe if you, in order to be a dinosaur, you have to have your own like proper like sticker made by a company like a panini for dinosaurs so that that you have the panini official body say okay we've we've checked the scientific data that is a dinosaur and that is a football player and then yeah. you can you can you know get it through that way every so often you get a, you get a shiny one yeah it's printed oh. on silver because it's special exactly but this is a genuine issue in taxonomy uh, i mean it's it's a real problem not that amateurs are getting involved in taxonomy because there's nothing wrong with that it's that in some cases people are deliberately doing bad work for self-aggrandizing and self-promoting reasons and that does not help people are getting gazumped as well well and and issues like that as well because I teach a taxonomy class to my students the, the actual process uh, as in the formal hoops to jump through to name a new species is incredibly easy doing it right is incredibly hard but all I'm really getting from this conversation is that in order to have a dinosaur named after you you need to not be a paleontologist but you need to know a paleontologist it's fairly common practice for paleontologists to have things named after them by their colleagues particularly when people are close to retirement or have made some massive contribution to a key area. So, or if nobody likes you and it's like an imprint of a slug. Well, yeah. So, so, so Linnaeus, so the, the oh, yeah, of course, Carl. basically the, the kind of founder of taxonomy and certainly the binomial of genus and species, was famous for naming ugly plants and weird, ugly animals after people he didn't like, um, or deliberately giving them species names that were rude, so they were attached to the genus with their name in it. For example, so I, I named. I had a paper came out uh, last year looking at aneurygnathid pterosaurs and in that I named a new genus uh, and I named it after my friend and colleague Liu Jin Chang who sadly died a couple of years ago and Liu and I had worked on this specimen before so it seemed particularly appropriate so that, that lined up you know That's really nice. nicely and it was a nice it was a nice 
start. It wasn't like it didn't have a massive bottom or something. So, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Um, and then also, I with a group of colleagues named a, a brinkosaur. So this is a Triassic animal, which is out outside of even the archosaurs, which we mentioned before. Wow, that's old. So yeah, so we named named that after Mike Benton, who was my PhD supervisor, and Mike's Mike's PhD was on brinkosaurs, and that's how he started. And this was a specimen actually held at Bristol, where Mike has worked almost his entire career. So that was brilliant because it's like it's a bunch of his former students naming something after him that he has worked on a lot and is kept in his institution's collection. So the point is, it's taken seriously. You're not going to have a little pterosaur called Santa's Little Helper or, or Snowball 3. You you do get this. So it varies massively from field to field. So if you think about things like things like spiders and ants and flies, their taxonomy is so far behind. And I don't mean that at a technical level. I mean, there are ludicrous numbers of new species being described all the time because there are not many people who work on it. And boy, are there a lot of species of flies. It's common for, you know, people doing things like fly taxonomy to write a paper with 10 new species in it. Wow. And so, you know, and some people have named hundreds of species in their career. When that's going on, it's not that they're necessarily frivolous, but you, you can see how people get bored <laughs> uh, and just stick a few names out there. And things like trilobites. There's loads of trilobites mm. named after famous people for various reasons because people just want to do it. So yeah, people like Darwin and Huxley and all kinds of famous scientists get loads of stuff named after them. The obvious dinosaur is there's a Masiakosaurus. Masiakosaurus. Not Florai. So it's named after Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits oh, because course. they were listening to Dire Straits when they found the fossil. Zool. Zool, which we talked about with Ralph Atanasia when he came on. So yeah, Zool is the ankylosaur named after the kind of devil dog things from Ghostbusters because it looked a bit like them. So yeah, there are there are some which are more frivolous and more fun. There are some which really annoy people. I know of a couple of things named after Pokemon, which <laughs> without being too much of an old fart seems a bit of a stretch even compared to Ghostbusters and I think is pushing it. Well, I'll tell you somebody who hasn't had a dinosaur named after them yet, and that is Professor Chris Jackson, who you might know because he presented the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures this year, and he is here to ask Dave his dinosaur facty question thing. What is your relationship with dinosaurs? Because I, I imagine you prefer your rocks more well inanimate than animate, in the sense that <laughs> we're never alive. They've had nothing to do with any, you know, biological messing aboutness. <laughs> oh, they do. Carbonate rocks. Yeah. I say carbonate rocks, of course, in many cases, used to be alive and now they're dead. I don't think we can count carbonate rocks as dinosaurs, can we, Dave? That's not a... Um, no, I, I think at least some you, you get, you, you do get the odd, so, you know, carbonate, so chalk and talk about the UK, white cliffs off Dover, you know, that is basically effectively a giant fossil. Uh, because that, that's, well, it is, it, it's kind of weird because that's basically what it is. But then you obviously you get fossils within that, you know, you do get fish and ammonite. And, and this kind of thing within those chalk beds. Yeah. That's probably, if you're doing your Venn diagram, that really should be the one bit where there's the least antagonism between our respective fields. <laughs> so it's, it's geologists, paleontologists and bluebirds. <laughs> oh, what, What's the bluebirds? Bluebirds bit? over the white cliffs of Dover. Dover. Oh, right. <laughs> there you go. If you just die with a sense of humour down four or five notches, you should hit us somewhere. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so do you have <laughs> we didn't actually ask. Do you have a relationship with dinosaurs? <laughs> I do. I do. I do have it. I do have a relationship with dinosaurs. I guess they were one of the early things that captivate a child's mind about the past in the broadest sense. There's that and Time Team, right? So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's those two things which make you think about things further back than last week. And so I guess I was always, I, I kind of was aware of them and, you know, they're spectacular and they ran around biting people. And I used to love movies with dinosaurs in. Time Team. Or, oh, okay. yes, that's, yeah. <laughs> Does Time Team have stop girl animation in it? Maybe. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Tony Robinson actually died in 2004. And since then, it's been... It's... <laughs> He's been animatronic. Painful animation. For- <laughs> I guess. I guess. I, I guess that kind of was very. You know that that brought to life the previous stuff that was on Earth, right? And and and. But then I never. But it wasn't. It wasn't really dinosaurs that then hooked me into geology because that's a regular 
thing you hear, right? Why did you study geology? Well, I liked volcanoes or dinosaurs. And that's true. And it makes sense, right? Because they are big ticket bits of geology. They're visually spectacular. They're important. They're really exotic. And that draws people in. But that was just, you know, that just happened not to be the case for me. And so I guess I kind of drifted away from dinosaurs from that early childhood of like watching these movies where there were like people in loincloths who were yeah. hunting like <laughs> saber-toothed tigers and they were being chased by T-Rexes, right? And at the time, it all seemed to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it all made perfect sense. And then I met paleontologists at university who then just told me it was all lies. So, you know, fast forwarding to that point, then when I started to interact more with paleontologists professionally, shall we say, where, you know, I worked with paleontologists, I knew some people studying paleontology. That's probably when it came back into my conscience. And and and, and I, I guess I had a second coming of learning about dinosaurs and paleontology as a practice as well, which is interesting in itself. <laughs> I, I have to say, I was, I was desperate to hear you say the phrase, and I, I drifted away from dinosaurs. And it's when I got my first pet rock that I really got into geology. Yeah, exactly. well, it was kind of like that, right? I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I guess when I saw rocks and the stories they told... That did, I found that massively exciting. And in the same way I could imagine if you saw a, a, a fossil, you know, a dinosaur bone or something, I could imagine the same kind of spark of excitement where you're like, oh, how big was this? Or how fast could it run? Or where did it live? Or like, is it related to this one over here? You know, it can be a very almost innocuous thing, like a rock. You know, we make that joke. But that rock contains so much information. And likewise, I could imagine dinosaur bone doing likewise. And I guess it's like, you know, it's, you know, maybe geology is the gateway drug into like paleontology, right? So, so like people... I think it's the other way around. Do this, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I didn't want to say it to the geologist, but... <laughs> Unless they're shiny and on a chain, most people aren't interested in rocks. I was going to say, That's it. I, I, I've, I've not, I've never been contacted by too many people who's like, it was always rocks for me until I heard about dinosaurs. It's- <laughs> there, there must be, no, 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 surely because when I'm people, sure there are some. There must but be I think people on who go average, to there must be people who go to university to study geosciences, and some of them are there because they love dinosaurs, right? But there's a bunch of people who are wandering around just trying to find something to do in their geology degree, and then paleontology, whichever bit of that, and then into the, the dinosaur bit of that, like. Maybe, maybe there is, maybe there is excitement brought to those people in those lectures where they're being taught about this rich history of the earth captured in these things that used to live a long time ago and don't live anymore, right? And and that and then if you couple like an understanding of dinosaur paleontology to climate change or anything else which paleontology speaks to, I think that's very, very exciting. So I could imagine, <laughs> I think you're doing a disservice to you, you know, paleontologists that I think there could be there could be a very strong pull imposed on people who maybe just didn't really think about it i don't think we all have oh to- yeah I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure it goes both ways it's just i you know i get emailed constantly by people who are like i've always wanted to get into paleontology and i've always wanted to do dinosaurs including people in like 30s 40s and 50s um which i you know and i can't imagine <laughs> that happens quite as often <laughs> It was famously done in Breaking Bad. Hank started rock collecting after his nervous yeah. breakdown. Very therapeutic. There's there's one. <laughs> yeah, but I, but but going back to Chris's Chris's point about like you know the the history that a rock can take. So one thing I do think is you know having done loads of outreach myself as well. One thing I think is true is what often unlocks people's interests is realizing the information that is available, and and that's and that's where the smallest lump of rock or dinosaur bone or half a slug or anything like that for the right person can become incredibly incredibly interesting and I, I always tell students this because we you know we do big research projects for in our final year and every sort you know there's only so many projects can go round, and students always end up with supervisors or on things they didn't necessarily really want to do and I always tell them just just invest you know just just get over the barrier of oh I don't think I'm going to like this very much and just work on it for a couple of weeks and you'll soon start learning stuff and you'll go oh that's interesting and within a couple more weeks you'll be all over it I must admit, I see a lot of like amazing things that paleontology that that's going on in the field of paleontology, and I do feel you know people sometimes ask me, what would you do if you weren't doing sedimentary basin analysis, right? And and I think paleontology would be, a, you know, I can I can see the appeal in it, I can see the the excitement in it. At least if, maybe it's one of those things looks incredibly glamorous and exciting from the outside, like lying down in the desert, like scrubbing yeah. stuff. But <laughs> exactly. Not really. 
but I'm just thinking this. It's not a massive leap, is it? It's like if I if I wasn't a sedimentary geologist, what would I be? And the answer wasn't lion tamer or train driver <laughs> or astronaut. It's another academic field in the earth sciences. <laughs> it just yeah, it's not, it's also not involves too... sediments. No, God, no. I I definitely would do something else. I'd become like a bike mechanic, right, or something, if I actually had a choice. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you do you have a question then that you'd like to ask Dave I do. about dinosaurs? I do. Go on then. Go it's on. A, it's a very serious question. Okay. Uh oh, that's not really our forte. What what, <laughs> what what defines a dinosaur? What is a dinosaur? When you're trying to define anything in science, in an evolutionary perspective, or a living or, or extinct organism, what we talk about is their evolutionary history. And so, what we're really doing when we identify something is effectively saying, "Here's the." Fact family tree, whether that be, you know, of birds or mites or ferns or whatever else. And here's all the different species and all their relationships and everything about their history. And we're effectively drawing a line somewhere, you know, snipping off a branch. And we're drawing a line at that point and saying everything after this we are calling X. Um, and of course, there's millions of subdivisions of them, which is why, you know, everyone's heard of Tyrannosaurus and they probably know that it's a Tyrannosaur in whatever that quite mean. But Tyrannosaurus is a member of Tyrannosaurine, a Tyrannosaur of Ede, Tyrannosaur Oidea, um, E-I-E-I-O. Salurosauria, Tetanura, Theropoda, and I've got some of those out sequence, but like on and on and on and on and on. Um, and so there's, you know, millions of these divisions effectively across all of biology. Um, but that, that's what we're doing. And so when you ask what is a dinosaur, we have a point on the family tree that basically by convention, we say everything after this point is a dinosaur. So so the reason I asked the question then is there's nothing that you would look at in something then that is a shared yeah, yes there a is a shared a shared physical or whatever it is beyond right. the simple evolution so, so, thing. So that's the second part of it. So if you've reconstructed your family tree and we've agreed what is that point and conventionally for the, the standard one, at least at the, there's a slight issue, but we'll, we'll skip that. The, the standard one, which still pretty much everyone uses is the nearest relative of Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus. So they're actually on very different lineages. And if you trace all their ancestors all the way down to a single point, everything which has branched off at any point since then is a dinosaur. What we would then do is on the data set that we used to generate that family tree, we would see what does everything after this point have and share in common? And what do things before this point not have? And then from that, yeah, we can write out a list of characters and go, okay, everything after this point has this, 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 and this. And it doesn't have that, 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 and that. So if you find a bone or a skeleton that has these features, by definition, it's basically a dinosaur. Could things change so much that it might be hard to work out? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, because I guess like evolution <laughs> means you're adapting to whatever is the prevailing, yep. you know, conditions in oh, which you find ab- something. Absolutely. So, so a really, a non-dinosaurian example, but a really easy one to give is many people have probably heard of legless lizards. There are lizards and skinks, multiple different lineages, in fact, that have lost their legs. And in Britain, we have slow worms. That's exactly what they are. They're legless lizards. Well, snakes don't have legs either, and they're a different group. So actually, snakes are kind of derived from lizards. But still, if you were if you were trying to define a snake, one of the key definitions you'd use is it hasn't got any legs. <laughs> now, unfortunately, that actually is true of some other groups as well, um, because yeah, evolution gets in the way. Another nice one in... It's actually a bigger group than dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs plus a bunch of other reptiles, including crocodiles, is called the archosaurs, the ruling reptiles. And a key feature of them is they have an antorbital fenestra. So a fenestra as in a window, an ant in front of and orbit the eye. Ah. So between the eye, if, so if you look at a dinosaur, almost any dinosaur skull in side view, you have a hole for the nose, a hole for the eye, and one in between. And that's the antorbital fenestra. Crocodiles have got rid of it, so they don't have one anymore. At least modern living crocodiles don't, if you look at their skulls. Yeah. Um, though the ancestral ones did. Um, triceratops, if you look up a triceratops skull, you'll see it basically doesn't have one. It got rid of it. So that's gone. Um, some of the big pterosaurs, well, actually all of the big pterosaurs. Um, so we, we talked about pterosaurs in an earlier episode. Um, so they've done a weird thing, which is their nostril and their antorbital fenestra have fused together 
into a single giant opening called the Naso Antorbital Pedestra. <laughs> so there are multiple different ways that you can modify or change this. And it doesn't mean that the presence of an antorbital fenestra isn't a good definition of archosaurs, but it also means you have to be aware that evolution has been busy about with anatomy <laughs> for 200 million years and that it may not be quite as clear. But this, this is, for example, a really good definition. It really shows really well why understanding evolutionary history, and particularly when we find intermediates of things, helps fill in those gaps. You know, I'm, I don't know my reptile taxonomic history. I imagine the history of working out snakes was a real pain. And so, because, you know, we've got all these legless lizards and then, the, and then I would be very surprised if the early taxonomists didn't think that all of the legless lizards were part of one group. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they were probably nearly the same as snakes. And of course, we now know that leglessness has evolved, I think four or five times, probably more. You don't need them. Well, it, for, for burrowing things in particular tend to get rid of them or things that are moving through lots of grass where actually legs might more Be get in the way, in the way than <laughs> stop you. Well, but basically, yeah, that's, that's what it is. And also for, for things that want really defined abs. That's getting rid of your legs. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you really get some, some work out on your... <laughs> That's an extreme <laughs> infomercial on some fringe TV channel. Is it's like, do you want to get buff, lose your legs, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll cut your arms off, and within six weeks of crawling around the house, <laughs> sure, surely, surely, what you do? No, you 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 put them in a sleeping bag and do it up round the neck, so you have to kind of caterpillar everywhere. <laughs> That's it, right? I'm going to market them. They're four hundred quid, and I'll sell them five pound sleeping bags from Argos with a drawstring. Round <laughs> that, that, whatever, whatever gets you through the COVID economic downturn, I say go for it. Um, no, thank you. That's very yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I'm always struck by that definition, and I, and I do love it when it's explained to me that like evolutionary history and the uncertainty and things, because that's one thing. I guess in my what I do, you know, trying to understand that uncertainty and quantify it, and sometimes when you're looking into other fields, it's not immediately apparent like where that uncertainty arises and how it might impact the certainty with which results are portrayed. And and whether like you, you use that point there that things might have been re have might have been erroneously classified. You know, the, knowing that history of the subject and how things have moved around between groups because people have had a fresh look or a new fossil or some new understanding of behaviour has arisen. It's very cool. Yeah, but they don't change it and it's still confusing. Our ornithicians have got nothing to do with birds. It's annoying. Why don't they change it? But that's because we've been sitting on that definition for 120 years and it seems a bit excessive to change it now. Ah. But you should be able to change it, no? <laughs> but but go, go, going back to your point, though, Chris, I mean, so a kind of related issue to that is when things... You, you can make... If you're right at the border of one of those big lines, you can make a very small change to, to the evolutionary position of an animal. But because we as scientists have drawn a hard border, cause real problems. So the obvious one is Archaeopteryx, which almost everyone has heard of and was famously the first bird. It's the earliest bird. And there's a bunch of analyses recently which have pulled Archaeopteryx down a bit and is now the other side of that line. Ah. And so Archaeopteryx immediately goes from being the first bird to not being the first bird. And in <laughs> evolutionary terms, all we've done is move it a couple of little notches on this giant tree of thousands of animals. But in terms of it being a bird or not, everyone sees that as being a massive thing because they know what a bird is and they know what a bird isn't. And of course, as you get up, you know, evolution doesn't usually have these enormous disjointed gaps where you just don't know what things are. And this is also why taxonomy does change all the time. You know, Linnaeus had birds and reptiles as equal, entirely separate ranks. And of course, we now know birds really are reptiles. So they're not equal and separate. They should sit within that. And then fish were, the, were a third one. Well, we now know that birds, mammals, reptiles and amphibians all ultimately evolved from a group of fish. We're all so fishes. birds sit within reptiles, sit within fish. So it's not really a... <laughs> you know, and this is why these things just don't work once you've got the evolutionary framework. Yeah, it's kind of is this it is odd, you know, the whole like birds are dinosaurs thing, trying to tell my daughters that, you know, they think it's kind of 
you know, blasphemy. Or <laughs> well, and it sounds made up. And we, yeah, and if you look at if you look at Diplodocus or Triceratops, well, of course it does. But if you look at things like Archaeopteryx and go, oh, it's little and it's got hollowed bones and it's got feathers, and, it goes, and suddenly ah! it's like, yeah, and suddenly it's like, oh yeah, it it looks just like a bird. Yeah, there's good reason for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, have we answered your question, Chris? Is this is this is you this have, making you you good? Yeah. You have answered my question. You've kind of made me feel more confident about pub quizzes, which is good because I That's often there good. is a paleontology question. And I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed that that is what comes up. How often are there sedimentary or I don't know maybe igneous rock questions coming up in pub quizzes in your experience? Depends which pub you go in. Really? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And and and, and are they right? Because I I I used to, I used to do loads of pub quizzes. I used to write pub quizzes for quite a while, and I I must have been the bane of at least a couple of pub quizzes um, lives because I do. It's I've lost a lot of it now. I used to have a phenomenal trivia knowledge, you know, and they'd ask questions, and I'd ask for clarification. <laughs> about things because you know what da, 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 da. it's like uh, you do know there's actually two of them right are there oh yeah <laughs> which oh, one no. is it you're that yeah. guy you, yeah but you i mean you'd, you'd get common because often they were reading them out from you know books or there was a company that used to send them round, so the quiz masters didn't actually know any of the context and i, re- I do remember one distinctly and they said what's the world's biggest bird and of course, the word "biggest" is really ambiguous. Um, Heaviest, longest, tallest. Well, right. Biggest winning span. That's the thing. So the, the so the among living birds, because of course among fossil birds, there's even more options. But the ostrich is the heaviest, but of course it doesn't fly. The wandering albatross has the biggest wingspan. The uh, Andean condor has the biggest wing area, and the great bustard is the heaviest that can fly. So that's four options just from living birds, and then of course you've got all the extinct ones so when they go what's the biggest bird and you go by what measure when and they go oh no and it's like i hope it's ostrich because i'll be really annoyed if it's great bustard <laughs> i always wonder in pub quizzes if people argue because they want the point or because they they want to be right in my case both <laughs> but but also also i guess it's it's a it's a question of fairness it's it's very annoying if I know the answer and I get it wrong because your question is badly written. I, I remember there's another one about something like in the Bible, on what day did God create? I think it's birds and they're different in Genesis chapter one and chapter two. <laughs> so depending on, you know, well, which, which one? <laughs> Nobody reads the Bible very much. It's always first Genesis. It's always first. Yeah. Literally, I mean, you don't need science to contradict the Bible. Genesis contradicts itself. So, well, that that, that in, is like, the horse the first... I'm backing as well. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> that is the horse I'm backing as well, Genesis chapter one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it is. But again, you know, Chris, I'm, I'm sure you get this with your own students. If you ask a slightly ambiguous question in an exam, however tiny that ambiguity is and however obvious what the correct answer is, you will get a complaining email. <laughs> so you're very sensitive to that. That is very, that is very, very true. <laughs> I used to go do very well in exams because I was one of these people who would see ambiguity in questions and run with it and write the most entertaining paper I possibly could (laughs) within the time frame because they'd misrode the question. And that always got me top marks because it was always a case of, oh, a brain is actually alive here and isn't regurgitating (laughs) the same thing again. (laughs) That's true. If you're marking exam papers for two weeks solid, you just need somebody to draw a smiley face in the... Do do, do something different. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. I've I've just been wading through a hundred odd things (sighs) that I had to mark. and And it's that thing when you get to the end I think this is a very specific problem. I, I suspect, I'm sure we'll be correct in the comments, that teachers don't get this. But I think academics do because the class size is generally so much bigger. When you've seen something for the 132nd time, it's really hard not to go, no, F minus, fail <laughs> for, one, for a simple mistake because you've written out on 136 papers already no you really need to reread this i don't think you understand it properly see 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 the notes for lecture seven next essay oh they've done it as well no it doesn't mean that you need to go back and read the lecture notes (laughs) just want to say on behalf of secondary school teachers that you guys have completely underplayed lots of them mark gcse's and a levels
Oh, uh, that's hands true. As to make up money over the holidays. No, that's very true. So that is hell on toast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not their own, because <laughs> that is that is five hundred of the At same question and yeah. everybody getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but so, so, as you say is so, sooner or later someone either does something different which even if it's not very good it's just such a pleasure to read or actually good and you're like oh i did teach this right that's that's always the fear you you mark about 20 wrong in a row and you're like did i explain this completely wrong did i get it backwards in my own lecture and then someone writes a brilliant essay and you're like oh thank god <laughs> i probably did teach it so a big thank you to Chris Jackson. That was really fun. I need to remind everybody that not only is the next episode chosen by you guys listening at home who are patrons because they've actually put money into joining it. We put a poll out. We gave a list of options and people have picked their favourite episode that they want us to talk about. That is next week. But also episode number eight is our questions episode. So if you have a question for Dave, he will happily ignore it because he doesn't know the answer and answer somebody else. No, he will do his best to answer (laughs) as many questions as we can possibly fit into one episode. So do email uh, terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. You can get in touch via our Patreon page or our Facebook page. But make sure you do that this week at the latest. Boy, do people ask the most obscure thing. (laughs) (laughs) I you to know really these don't things. know the answer to yeah. It takes me back to when I was at university and doing my doing my zoology degree, and my dad would be digging in the garden and he'd find something and he'd bring me like a beetle and go, What's this? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, You're doing a zoology degree. Why don't you know? <laughs> it's like <laughs> what 10,000 British beetle species and I've never studied beetles I have not the faintest clue what this thing is this is what a beautiful thing you should just lie it's but 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 it's the same problem it's like oh he's a dinosaur expert and it's like yeah and there's 1500 species there's about 50 new papers published a week if I just read papers all day every day I couldn't read everything let alone remember it so no I don't know everything all I'm saying is episode 8 is going to be great I'm not going to show him them until we actually go live it's going to be wonderful so uh, he's crying now it's fine so um, I hope that's helped you understanding what taxonomy is and uh, not taxidermy yes until next week we will say thank you for listening to the terrible lizards podcast with Izzy Lawrence and Dr. Dave Hone this episode was only made possible thanks to our patrons on Patreon and for listeners like you who share our content with your friends. So please spread the word on social media. You can find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk, email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com, We are hoping to bring you so much more, but we can only do that if our audience continues to grow. So please like, share and subscribe.